creator Claudine Francois and the founder of In Good Clean Taste. I am dedicated to helping women entrepreneurs design a healthy lifestyle by incorporating healthy, delicious tools, tips, and resources that empower their inner and outer game. Every episode, my featured guest and I share our healthy, delicious lifestyle journey on my globally recognized show, Healthy Delicious Lifestyle with Claudine. Hello and welcome to Healthy Delicious Lifestyle with Claudine. I'm so excited for today's topic. It is how to end the dieting struggle, rediscover self-esteem with dietitian coach Jana Maurer. And if you're enjoying the content, please like and subscribe. I am content creator and functional medicine practitioner Claudine Francois. And if your health is suffering and you have run all the tests only to be told everything's normal, I would like to be of service. Women are getting incredible insights out of the complimentary sessions that I am offering for a limited time to decode those lab results and show you what you can do to take action. So get the link in the scroll or grab it in the comments. Now let's get to today's show. I'm so excited to bring up today's guest. She is a wonderful person. She is so amazing and has done some awesome things. So I'll bring her up from the green room as soon as I tell you all about her. Jana is a res- registered dietitian and owner and CEO of Health Wins with Jana, an online nutrition coaching and consulting company based out of Fresno, California. Jana is on a mission to help women break the cycle of chronic dieting to finally feel healthy, strong, and confident in themselves, their food choices, and their body. I get goosebumps just saying that. That was super awesome. Jana, welcome to the show. Hi, Claudine. Thank you for having me. Oh, it is my absolute pleasure. Thank you for being here and to share your awesomeness with us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know this topic is really near and dear to my heart. So I'm I'm really excited to be able to continue the conversation and hopefully serve some more women today. Absolutely, because we should mention that you did a um, a nice long talk at one of the premier women's conferences. I think it's the largest one in California, and you just did that recently. So thank you for bringing that to my community as well, for those who couldn't attend, those who don't live in this area. So that's, I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great experience. We had, there was over like 3,700 women that joined in, and then uh, about 300 some that joined into the breakout session. So it was quite the day. Yay! So good, so good. All right, so to continue the conversation, um, the first thing I'm going to ask you is the first thing that I ask all my guests, which is, what does a healthy, delicious lifestyle mean to you? So I loved this one because I really like. I sat back in my seat and I was like, "Oh, what does this mean?" And the the first word that popped into my mind was that it means that you're limitless. So so often with the women that I work with, or just in the diet space as a whole, I. I oftentimes hear how it restricts us and how it makes us feel actually worse about ourselves, And that is not the goal of health whatsoever. The goal of health is for you to feel limitless to where you can take on anything that you want to, because you feel great, you feel healthy, you feel strong, you feel empowered, right? Like these are all the things that we want to feel when we are stepping into that health space and when we're truly caring for ourselves. So when I think about that, it's you're limitless. Like you could do whatever you want. Just go do it. Right. Like you had the permission to do that there. And um, you're not confined by any, any, anything or anyone, essentially. Mm, that was amazing. I'm going to go do my Wonder Woman stance right now because I'm limitless. <laughs> that was so good. Oh, what a great reminder. Everybody out there, you are limitless. You can do whatever you want. And having a healthy, delicious lifestyle means you get to make choices that support you. I love that. So good. Yeah. So I want to get to some of your tips because your tips are really, really good. And this first one is no food eats alone. What do you mean by that? Tell us more. (laughs) So this one, um, I was, you know, when you're, when I'm thinking about how to provide education to individuals, I always think about, okay, but how does this apply, right? Like, so we could have all the knowledge, but it doesn't mean that we're actually applying that knowledge. And so I'm really big in making sure that one, it sticks in our mind, right? Like we remember it. And then two, when we're visually eating, 
we can also see those principles at play, right? Like a lot of us are visual and we see our food before we even taste our food. And so what no food eats alone means essentially is that there's no one food item that's just on your plate. There's other foods or other macros that you're eating it with. For example, like I see this a lot with women just as a whole, they only have coffee in the morning or maybe they have like a, like a piece of toast or whatnot. And then they say like, I'm really hungry throughout the day. And then I have all these cravings at night. It's because we did not use this no food eats alone principle where you are actually pairing that toast with some peanut butter or some eggs, right? Like, so we're having the carbs, the protein and the fat together. That's really building up the meal. That's helping you feel full and satisfied. And that's also helping prevent cravings later on. So that's where the no food eats alone comes in. Once we start applying that principle, you can not only visually see it, but you can also feel it in your body. Again, feeling full, satisfied, content. Those are the goals during meal times. And then we see some of those other things that we usually want to move away from, like those cravings and that excessive hunger that really subsides. Oh, that is such a healthy, delicious lifestyle delicious. moment. I love that. And what you're reminding me of too, when you say pairing things, um, getting a protein with that carb or, you know, get making sure you have fiber with the proteins, those kinds of, and the carbs, it reminds me of, you know, I used to be really carb heavy and I'd have these lulls, these like drop in energy a couple hours later, or I'd get brain fog because I, or, or like you said, have the hunger because I didn't have the protein to satiate me. And as we were talking earlier, that reminds me so much. And so I'm backwards. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. This reminds me so much of this book, Glucose Revolution by Jessie Anchospé. Yes, she is French, and that's not the only reason why I like her. Um, but yeah, she talks about that in, um, where you say no food eats alone. I think she says, put clothes on your carbs. So she'll talk Ooh. about, you know, she's French, right? So like, you go to the bakery and you get a fresh baguette and she's like, but I have to wait until I get home and I can have some nuts first and then I can put some butter on it for fat. And that way I am reducing the sugar spike, the blood sugar spike of those carbs. So that is a great, great reminder. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. Put, put clothes on your carbs. I love that. I'm going to have to steal that <laughs> one too. Yeah. It's so fun. And then your second tip, which is movement after meals is key. Why is movement after meals important? So I am also a certified diabetes educator. So I've worked with a lot of individuals that are looking to prevent diabetes or um, manage their diabetes. And while yes, that is like a chronic disease, the reality is, is that all of us need to be managing our glucose throughout the day, right? This is something that we do for a healthy, delicious lifestyle is to be able to manage our blood glucose throughout the day. And the movement after meals is really helping with that. So we have found that we can reduce that blood sugar response post a meal when we do engage in movement. And movement can really be anything. It could be a dance party with your kids. It can be going for a quick walk outside. Um, it doesn't have to be where you're having to go to the gym or lift weights or whatnot. We just don't want to be in a sedentary position. So, so oftentimes think about it, like in a lifestyle perspective, we might have dinner and then we're going to go sit on the couch and watch our, our favorite show. Well, we can still do that, but we want to break it up just a little bit. So after dinner, maybe if you do dishes, at, you know, after dinner, if you do them in the morning, everyone has their preference. Um, but after dinner, you go for a five to 10 minute walk and then you can go and enjoy the rest of your evening. That really helps with preventing that glucose sp uh, spike and then drop. And it also helps with maintaining a healthy weight just throughout our lifetime. Um, so that's why I really like that tip after meals in general. And I will say for me, I love that tip because I tend to want to just go and sit in my favorite chair after dinner or <laughs> just go relax. But I, I'll, what, what I've, since I learned this myself, I thought, why don't I do laundry right now? Like where you're getting mm -hmm. up, you're taking clothes out of the dryer, put or washing them and putting them in the dryer. You're, you're active, even if it's not quote unquote, exercising, or right. you're cleaning up the kitchen, you're doing the dishes, you're running after the kids, like something that keeps your body moving to help your body process the sugars, you know, whatever kind of sugars they were in your meal and help uh, reduce that glucose spike, right? Yeah. Well, and I think I love that, Claudine, because so we oftentimes think like from a metabolism perspective, like <clears throat> we need to go and do that like hardcore workout but that's only a very small portion of our metabolism. And then there's this other portion that we call NEAT is our non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is like really scientific, right? 
But what that essentially means is all the other things that you do throughout the day that move your body and keep it active and keep it going. That's what we really want to hone in on because that has a really large impact on our metabolism. And so going and doing the laundry, that is actually part of that neat portion where you are moving your body and actually supporting a healthy metabolism. So I love that. And I always love to think about that for women or men. And I mean, anyone in general, any individual, how can you move your body more even outside of that gym time? Oh, so, so good. And I want to bring up another book that you had, um, that you had brought to my attention. I had it. I had to go find it. I was like, where is it? Atomic <laughs> Habits by James Clear. Super good book. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit shiny, so it's hard to see. Um, but I have a picture of it here I'll bring up. And I actually, with my clients, I created a whole training on Atomic Habits because you and I know in the health and wellness industry that habit forming is a huge portion of someone's success. So tell me how you use this book with your clients and what like nuggets that you think would be helpful for people who are looking to create new healthy habits. Yeah. So I am a dietitian, so I do have there's a little uh, you know special pocket in my heart for nutrition, and I know that it's not the only part of the equation when it comes to living a healthy lifestyle. So this is where I say nutrition is part of the equation, but it's not the entirety of the equation. And I really want to look at what your behaviors are or what your lifestyle looks like throughout the 24 hours that we have each day that are either contributing to health or maybe not contributing to your health. And so we, I really take a behavioral based approach with my coaching clients and saying, okay, what are these behaviors that we can really dive into? And I think that's what James Clear does in his atomic habits, right? Our habits are our behaviors and mm -hmm. they contribute to ultimately how we feel throughout the day. So we really do a deep dive into, okay, what are those habits? What are those behaviors that are working or not working and how can we start to shift them? And he does so, he just makes it so easy, right? Like we don't want it to be more complicated and complex, right? Like, in fact, like the more complicated and complex we make it, usually the more we disengage from it. So we want it to be simple. We want it to be realistic. It might not be easy because it's something new, but as long as we can keep it simple and realistic and repeat it, we usually can start getting that progression and then we can get the results. Yes. So good. And one of the examples, I think this is one of the ones that he gave was if you decide that you want to work out in the morning, remove all barriers to working out, like put your clothes out, like decide already what you're going to wear, put them by the side of your bed so that you just get up, you put on your clothes and you go, you don't have to think about it. And the right. other thing that I really love um, that I remind my clients about is when you create a new habit and then you miss a day, like let's say you skip a day, skipping a day is fine. But once you skip two days or more, you've actually created a new habit. So doing as much as you possibly can to maintain the habit, because that is reinforcing the neural network in your brain. Kind of like when you drive out of your house, you probably either turn left or right, right? That's a habit. You often don't think about it. You want the new habit that you're trying to create to be that instinctual, right? That you just automatically do it. Like I automatically get up on Tuesdays and go on my treadmill. That's just something I've done for years now. And I don't really even think about it. I don't consider, well, maybe I don't want to today. I'm just like, I would, what would I do on a Tuesday morning if I didn't do that? <laughs> well, yeah. And that highlights the consistency aspect, right? Like anything that we do consistently, we're usually going to get some type of result. Right. <laughs> whether, whether it's a result that we want or not, we're still going to get a result because we show up to it consistently. Um, and I love this when it comes to like coffee, right? Like a lot of people really enjoy coffee in the morning and they're not going to forget to get their coffee. So how could we pair a habit with that? That's something that you're not going to forget. So that's usually where I'll say like, okay, how can we get some water in before you have your coffee? Right. Like so that we start pairing those habits together, or what he calls habit stacking. Um, in a way that you still have your established behavior that you enjoy and love and you're not going to forget. And now we're adding in this other behavior that's also going to um, enhance your health. Yes, I love that. That one's so good. And I'll often say like, this is a great time to write in your gratitude journal. <laughs> right. While it's brewing. Yes. I love exactly. that. You, you got time. You got a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. So good. All right. Well, the next tip. So this is a tip that I created based on some of the things that I knew we were going to talk about, which is loving food in a healthy way will set you free. And 
I say this because I feel like a lot of us have made food the enemy. It's like, oh, I can't have this or, oh, I can't have that. Or, you know, if I have this, I'll gain 10 pounds or, you know, like, I feel like there's a lot of negativity that we associate with food. And how, how do you, how do you work with that with your clients? Because I think one of your, your uh, sweet spots is working with people who've had a disordered um, relationship with food. Yeah. So from this perspective, I really like to think of it as the emotions of weight loss. So what emotions do we have established as it relates to caring for ourselves? And if the, the goal is weight loss, sometimes the goal is not weight loss. Um, sometimes it really is to have a healthier relationship with food. Um, and so what I have found is that oftentimes the emotion that is running the show, if you will, is fear. And fear really doesn't create any sense of health or well-being. It really just usually retreats us. It usually keeps us in a very vicious cycle where oftentimes like the women that I work with, they are chronic dieters. They've tried every diet under the sun. They restrict food or from a form of calories or specific food items. They may binge feel guilty, feel shameful, and then do this whole cycle over again, right? Like, so even within that cycle, we have the guilt and the shame. Those are all negative emotions. And so as we start to, one, identify those negative emotions and start to move them towards maybe more neutral or more positive emotions, we start seeing a completely different relationship with food, how we see food, how we nourish our body, and ultimately how we show up to care for ourselves as well. So loving food in a healthy way can really open up and change your entire mindset of how you're interacting with something that you, we get to do several times a day, right? Like, I mean, we could be doing, we could be eating food anywhere from three to five or more times a day. So we don't want that fear to stay around. We really want to have a positive association with something that is going to be with us our entire life, right? Like the reality is we need food to nourish our body. And so how can we create a really good relationship with it? That is such a good reminder because there are people who they can't even get the nutrients they need because they are, they have this disordered relationship with foods that either they, I've, I've had clients who can't swallow because they have some kind of fear or block mental block that is preventing them from actually eating food to get into their system. Or I'm sure you've probably dealt with people with issues like anorexia or bulimia where they just cannot get the nutrients in. And it's such a good reminder that it starts with your mindset. Yeah. Well, and I like to, so there are certain like eating disorders, right? But then there's also disordered eating. And mm -hmm. I would say that a majority of women, the way that we have been taught, particularly if we have been exposed to diet culture is more of that disordered eating aspect, right? Like restriction of calories. I can only have 800 to a thousand calories a day if I want to lose weight, or if I overeat, then I need to over exercise or, mm -hmm. um, again, like, so I can't have a slice of bread because that's going to make me fat, right? Like those are all things that come up with that disordered eating aspect that, um, is not necessarily, uh, a anorexia or bulimia, right? Like a diagnosis, but more of what we have ingrained in our culture to be acceptable for women to nourish their bodies. That is really getting us into that unhealthy relationship with food. That is such a good reminder. And I will say that a lot of the women that I work with, oh, you have a kidney. Hi, cat. Yes. Your cat wants to be in the show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will say that a lot of the, the women that I work with have have had a challenged relationship with food. And oftentimes, if, if it's a weight loss issue, if they can't, if they feel like they're never at their ideal rate, it's ideal weight, it's often because there is something else going on in the body, whether it's some kind of gut issue, whether it's some kind of hormone imbalance. So I'm just going to remind everyone, if you have had issues that you have not been able to get resolved by your doctor for a limited time, I am doing these free lab reviews. So I'll put the link below. All right, let us get to the last tip, which is, here it is. You are beautiful and you are loved no matter what the scale says. And I feel like this is really important to say, because as we just talked about, so many of us have been brought up in the diet culture or even just the Western ideals that says we have to look a certain way. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. So this one gives me goosebumps. Um, I love this one, Claudine, because I think it really gets to the core that many women struggle with. And maybe we don't talk about it as much as I think would be healthy for us to. So I got to thinking, and I was actually talking to my mom about this. I got to thinking, when did women learn that the first thing they needed to do in the morning was to get on the scale? So I find this very, you know, I'm just curious about this. How did we, one, learn that for ourselves, and how was it passed down generationally, right? Like, so the talk that I shared at the women's conference was breaking the generational ties, because oftentimes, um, you know, our grandmother taught our mom and our mom taught us, right? Like, so it's passed down. But one thing that I find really curious is that we all kind of learn, or the majority of women that I know still weigh themselves in the morning to kind of determine their, how they're going to feel for the day. So, so many women have shared with me, they get on the scale and if the scale is down, they feel really good and they might um, take care of themselves in a different way. If the scale is up, they might really beat themselves up and be like, oh, you know, the scale went up. What did I do wrong? And it's going to change how they eat. It might change how they exercise, right? Like, so it changes how you not only see yourself, but also how you care for yourself throughout the day. And that's something that I really want to, one, open up the conversation around with women and really get curious about, is that effective? Is that truly us caring for ourselves? And is this something that is healthy that we need to keep around? Now, I am not, I'm not against the scale. So I still think that the scale can be utilized. I think it's a number that gives us a lot of good information. And I think that it can be part of a very healthy relationship with your body. But or I should say, and I'm curious as to why we go to it every single day to determine that worth, that value, that love. So that's where I want to disconnect it. Um, because regardless of that number on the scale, you are still beautiful. You are still worthy. You are still very much so loved. And we want to show up in that way throughout the day. Oh, I just got goosebumps everywhere. That was so good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's really important that women hear that because where else are they going to hear that? I, I don't ever mm -hmm. hear that anywhere else. And I'm a woman. So <laughs> uh, right. yeah, it's really important that, that we bring that conversation more to the forefront. And um, I'm so grateful that you are, you are helping women with this because you're right. There is such a societal pressure. There's such a, like, what have we grown up with? What are the thoughts that we believe are true? the patterns right. that we that we have created around this issue that aren't necessarily not only not healthy, but aren't doing us any favors, right? If we are allowing something like a scale to affect our vision of ourselves, you know, and rather than using it as a tool, which it can be used as a tool, then that is a different conversation, right? 100%. Exactly. Love mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And understanding how it shows up is so powerful, right? Like, so it, again, like you said, it can be a tool that is used in a healthy fashion, but it doesn't mean that it gets to dictate how you care for yourself. And that's the big difference. Yes. That was a much better way of saying that. Good job. <laughs> You're good with the words. <laughs> and I do want to talk about this tea that you brought up. So this is a throat coat lemon echinacea tea because we're talking about taking care of ourselves. One great way to take care of yourself, especially if you feel like you're getting a little bit under a weather is to find a supportive tea. So tell me what you like about this tea. Well, actually I need to go brew some right now. Um, no, I love this. I love this tea because especially with the weather change, right? Like we're coming in, well, we are in fall coming into winter. Um, we oftentimes see where we get a little, um, you know, flu, different illnesses are going around. And this is, this is a practice of taking care of your health. So um, warm, warm uh, liquids can be so soothing to our bodies as a whole. And then just the whole behavior of brewing some tea, sitting maybe in silence and peace and just enjoying it for a, a, a a moment, whatever moment you have can be very soothing to the body. So I like tea as a whole. And then I, I chose this one throat coat because I do a lot of talking. And so it helps soothe the throat. Um, but also if you notice that you get sore throats throughout the winter season or whatnot, this can be really helpful just to soothe that and feel, feel much better. Oh, 
such a good reminder. I'm going to go get me some. That looks really good. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Janet, thank you so much for sharing all of this wisdom with us. So where can people find you if they want to hear more? If they want to hear more, I encourage you to follow my Instagram page. Go give me a follow. It's Jana Mauer RD. Um, and then if you also want to just check out my website, it's healthwinds.org. Wonderful. And I'll link all that. Oh, and tell us about the snack guide. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, so again, going along the lines of no food eats alone. So one of the things that a lot of women will um, sh you know, share with me that could be helpful is just different ideas of how to pair foods in a way that's really healthy for them. So I created a snack guide that shows how to pair um, different foods for snacks throughout the day. So there's over 40 different snack ideas. And then I also break down why this would be really um, healthy for you, particularly if you're looking to lose weight, manage your blood sugar, or if you're looking for a good post-workout meal. So those are the three options that are included in the snack guide that's completely free to you um, and hopefully you find it of benefit. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. I went and grabbed it. It is awesome. There's a wonderful grid and one of the first few pages that kind of lays it all out. So it's an easy one-stop shop if you're just like, just tell me the snacks. But also you have so much great information if someone wants to learn more. So I appreciate you for sharing that with our community. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome, Jenna. This has been great. I am so grateful for you for being here today. Yeah, thank you so much. I think this is a this is a great conversation. And I just really thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to continue to share the message um, as well. So thank you. Yay. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop you into the green room. So hang out, grab a mocktail. I'll be back there in a second. <laughs> oh my gosh. Was that not amazing? So, so good. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I want to remind you, how are you creating a healthy, delicious lifestyle for yourself today? Until then, join me for another episode of Healthy Delicious Lifestyle with Claudine next Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Central and have a healthy, delicious lifestyle. Thank you for joining me today. You can learn more about me, my products and services at ingoodcleantaste.com. Be sure to join me for another episode every Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific or 11 a.m. Central Standard Time on my globally recognized show, Healthy Delicious Lifestyle with Claudine.